Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Nandini, and I'm one of your Athenaeum Fellows for this year. This week, my hometown of Murrieta, California, is opening up its elementary schools part-time. They have assigned students to A or B days, with students coming to school two out of five days. On one hand, there has been a lot of enthusiasm on behalf of some teachers and parents to get back to normal. On the other hand, some teachers and parents are frustrated that the current part-time schedule exhausts more energy and resources than completely being online. When it comes to public education, a one-size-fits-all policy that serves the needs of students of all backgrounds rarely ever works. Today at the ATH, Dr. Vinay Prasad will make the case that unless local healthcare systems are approaching overload or collapse, schools should remain open. Dr. Vinay Prasad is a practicing hematologist, oncologist, and associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Prasad studies the quality of medical evidence, cancer drug development, clinical trial design, and healthcare policy. Clinically, Dr. Prasad cares for patients with a wide range of benign hematologic and malignant conditions. His work utilizes a wide range of epidemiological methods and falls into the category of meta-research. He is the author of over 250 academic articles and books, including Ending Medical Reversal and the 2020 Malignant. He also hosts a podcast, Plenary Session, and runs a YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad, MD, MPH. Dr. Prasad's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the amazing Rose Institute of State and Local Government at CMC. Dr. Prasad will present for about 30 minutes before jumping into conversation with me and Chris. Using the Q&A function, we will accept questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send in a question, please state your affiliation with the college. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Prasad to the Athenaeum. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And, and thank you all for having me. And um, I, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, and I um, hope that uh, someday it will be back in person. Um, so, you know, uh, the title of my, my talk is, uh, should schools be open, COVID-19, should schools be open? And I'm going to try to make the case to you that schools really ought to be open. And if we could look at things through the retrospectoscope, I think my position on this issue is that in March of 2020, um, when we were facing incredible uncertainty about SARS-CoV-2, the virus, about what it would do to health systems, I think it was reasonable at that point to suspend schools as we did, public uh, schools um, and, and private schools in the middle of March. Um, what I think is the question mark is by the fall of 2020, I think we had had mounting evidence to suggest that the calculus really favored schools being open as much as possible in the absence of healthcare collapse. And I'm gonna take you through why I feel so strongly that that is the case. And, and then we can turn into a discussion and you can push, you can push on me as hard as you wish um, because I know it is a controversial space. So why do I believe that schools must reopen? I, I'll put it to you this way. I think by the end of this talk, I hope to convince you that when it comes to the point of view of children, there is a massive benefit to children. Children benefit more from open schools than they do from, clo cold, from closed schools. Let's talk about parents. I think I will persuade you that parents also benefit immensely from having open schools. Um, I wish to suggest to you that there is, in fact, a likely, at most, a modest elevated risk to those who participate as teachers and staff in schools. However, I will try to persuade you this is modifiable. We're able to bend this downward. And it is not as high as the risk to people in other essential work, such as taxi drivers, such as folks who do construction work and folks who work in kitchens. They, have, they face higher risks. Um, finally, I will try to convince you there's no risk to society in terms of broader spread, which is deeply counterintuitive. I will admit to you that our intuition about respiratory viruses is that they spread wildly in schools. They're driven by school spread. SARS-CoV-2 exhibits fundamentally different properties. I hope to persuade you of that. And then lastly, I'm going to step outside my comfort zone and make the provocative claim to you that there is a risk to the very structure of our society, there's a risk to democracy if closures continue. So let me make that case. Okay, 
Anytime you talk about school closures, I think we have to be honest and recognize one fact that schools were never all closed lockstep. They were open in many places. This is a map um, just about a week old that looks at the, the availability of in-person learning. And it's a striking map because the West Coast is among the lowest in terms of in-person children under the age of 18 in public schools, whereas Florida, 99.9%, uh, Montana, 100%. This is a very uh, interesting map. It doesn't follow um, any sort of traditional um, uh, traditional sort of thinking. Let me walk you through what I think has accounted for the differences in school openings. Um, one. If you are fortunate enough to have the funds to send your kids to private school, you can do so. In almost every municipality, you can find a private school that will accept your child in person, and many wealthier parents have done that. P private schools are open far in excess of public schools, so that's one of the challenges here. Two, daycares. Even in places where schools are closed for kindergartners, if your child is three or four or five or six, you can get them into an in-person daycare, a paid daycare. In places like California, the exact building that used to be for elementary school is being leased by third parties in some cases to run a Zoom, uh, a Zoom school. So you drop off your child at your school, the child will open the laptop and then attend virtual school with his virtual teacher and the staff of that will be private staff political affiliation. There are a number of emerging studies that have suggested that schools in classically democratic stronghold cities, such as San Francisco, Chicago, Washington, DC, they are much more likely to be closed than places where there is local Republican control of government. This is a paradox because the virus shouldn't appreciate these factors. The virus, uh, if school closure was really proportionate to the virus, it should have some relationship to these other metrics. But it turns out, to my knowledge, there is no relationship between where schools are open and closed and the actual cases per 100,000. There's no relationship to the ICU bed utilization in that area. And there's no relationship to hospitalizations. So what explains school closures is politics, um, and that politics was exacerbated in the summer of 2020 when Donald Trump suggested schools be open. I think in many places, democratically, um, they, there was a, a push to defy that, that, that recommendation, um, and also based on wealth. Um, and so this, I think, is, uh, is a difficult proposition to justify. When you think about whether or not schools should be open or closed, I believe that we always, in terms of health policy, we have to think about who it affects. And I think there are three core constituencies. There's kids. There's teachers and staff, their parents and society. They all matter. They all truly matter. And if we open schools, there's impact on kids, teachers and staff and parents. And if we close them, there are impacts. So let me walk you through my thinking. Let's think about schools, if we open schools. So it turns out with children, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has something called a steep age gradient, which means if you're over the age of 80 and you are, in, and you are infected with SARS-CoV-2, there may even be as high as a one in five chance you will die. That is extremely lethal. That is an extremely lethal virus in that age group. But for children, the risk of bad outcomes, including something called the multi-inflammatory uh, syndrome in kids or death is exceedingly rare. This is data that emerged in the New England Journal of Medicine out of Sweden. This was the Swedish experience between March and June of 2020. Now, notoriously, Sweden did not close the schools. Out of 1.95 million children who attended schools in person in Sweden, no masks, no distancing, no mitigation efforts, there were 15 cases of multi-inflammatory syndrome in kids. That is about one in 130,000 kids in Sweden at a time where there was brisk community transmission. Um, this suggests that I think children and a number of studies show they're less likely to contract SARS-CoV-2. They're much more likely to have a very mild or asymptomatic case. They're exceedingly unlikely to die on the order of one in 100,000, um, which is really kind of on par with seasonal influenza in children under the age of 10, for instance. Um, it is a dramatically different disease in children than it is in, in the elderly. In North Carolina, in the fall of last year, 
case transmission was brisk. We're talking one to two new cases of SARS-CoV-2 per 1,000 people. Despite this, this is a right of center state. They made a concerted effort to open schools and they did in fact do so. They did so with precautions, with masks, with distancing in place, with, with some precautions being done. And here's what they found. This is the pediatrics paper on the North Carolina experience. They found that there was a number of transmissions that occurred there were a number of children or adults who had who came down with SARS-CoV-2, something around 700. But they performed contact tracing to try to isolate where they where they acquired the virus, and they were only able to show that schools resulted in 32 cases. They conclude this: if the transmission inside the school was the same as the rate in the community, that one in 1,000 rate, we would have expected 800 to 900 secondary infections within schools. In fact, we only found 32 cases within schools of SARS-CoV-2 transmission. What does this tell me? This tells me that if you were a child in North Carolina, the safest place for you was actually to be in the school. It was preferable to being in the community. Um, schools are much less likely to spread than the community in this North Carolina study. This was the study out of Wisconsin. This is published in the CDC's journal. This looked at K through 12 schools. Again, they used masks. They tried to cohort the students, limit the class size to 20. They maintained distance, but I spoke to the study author and the distance was maintained between cohorts. Within a cohort, they were not very strict about the six feet of distance. And I will tell you why that matters by the end of this talk. If a person was known to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2, they were quarantined after exposure. Now, we're talking about weekly incidents here between 34 to 1,000 per 100,000 people. Um, this is one in 100. Um, this, is, this, is ex this is amongst the briskest transmission that is occurring in pandemic spread. So these are not places that I'm picking because there wasn't a lot of COVID at the time. These are places with rip-roaring SARS-CoV-2. And what they found was students were remarkably good at adhering to wearing masks. And teachers reported that they had a 92% adherence rate. And what they found rather dramatically was in 13 weeks of in-person learning, there were only seven out of nearly 5,000 students who were found to have spread or acquired, or found to have acquired SARS-CoV-2 in school and zero out of 654 staff. Um, this, is, this is another sort of example, United States data of how relatively safe it is to be in school compared to the broader community. What about the risk to teachers? I've just given you two instances where there was very little transmission from student to teacher. Um, in the case of Wisconsin, there were zero instances where the student was found to have spread it to the teacher. Um, in the in the Swedish data that I cited to you, there was they found that there was no increased risk of a teacher developing severe SARS-CoV-2 than an average um, age sex matched member of the community. But but I would say I'm willing to believe that there is possibly a slight increased risk to staff. I, I don't wish to say this trade-off has no trade-off. I think it's possible that it is slightly more risky um, to be a teacher uh, in school than a teacher on Zoom. But what, what is the magnitude of that risk? In Sweden, from an earlier study that appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they roughly found that at a time where you had a two in 1,000 chance of acquiring SARS-CoV-2 in the community, a teacher working with young children with no mitigation, no masks, no distancing, was roughly six in 1,000. That's about three times lower than a taxi cab driver. In the United States, some of the most high-risk occupations are the person who works in the kitchen who prepares the food. Um, you know, we don't have in-person dining, but the kitchen is a, is a place where uh, there's a number of transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, construction workers, people who are remodeling houses. Um, teachers are, you know, it's a three times risk, but it's still a very low risk. And, it, you know, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. This is, this is one of the most, um, I would say, highest estimates of risk to teachers. What about the community? I mean, when before I entered, you know, before SARS-CoV-2 hit, and I, I spent a lot of time reading about SARS-CoV-2, um, my understanding as a physician of respiratory viruses was, you want to avoid a respiratory virus in the winter? Well, then stay away from kids. That's what we told people for, for decades. And that was really true when it comes to seasonal influenza, when it comes to rhinovirus, the viruses that hit us every winter. But what about SARS-CoV-2? Is it really spread by the opening and closing of schools? Now, there have been a number of studies that have tried to investigate this, some in top journals like uh, Nature Journals. One of the challenges is, and you know this to be true, when when cities close schools, what do they do? 
They do a lot of things all at once. They get on TV and somebody says, look at this hospital. We are drowning in patients who are presenting with SARS-CoV-2 with COVID-19. Be scared. Two, stay home. Stay home. Wear a mask, perhaps a mask mandate. Shelter in place orders are placed and schools are closed. This all happens together. So how can you isolate the effect of school closure from all the other interventions if we're deploying them all within three days of each other? And the answer is it's very difficult. In fact, I believe it's probably impossible to disentangle that. But one country has provided us with a very useful piece of data. And that's what I'm gonna show you on the screen. This is Germany. In Germany, they made a very concerted effort to keep kids in school except for the summer break. And the summer break in Germany is not the same dates everywhere in Germany. If you live in one part of Germany, it's, Feb it's March 30th, and the next part it's April 15th, and the next part it's May 1st. Uh, I don't know the precise dates, but they're all staggered. They're staggered by a week. And the reason perhaps is some people say it's, it's to prevent the summer resorts from being overcrowded. So the point is, though, they've staggered their vacations in all these different school districts. But when they implement restrictions against SARS-CoV-2, those all happen on the same days. So suddenly there's a natural experiment. We can suddenly disambiguate the effects of school closure from all of those other things we do when things get worse with SARS-CoV-2. And shown here in the red is the coefficient, the daily rate of SARS-CoV-2 spread in the community when schools are open. And in the blue, it's when schools are closed. And if you believe that schools are a fundamental driver of SARS-CoV-2 spread, the blue should be far lower than the red. But in fact, the authors find there is no difference, both on the closure side and on the reopening side. They have staggered both ways. This German study, I think, is the best causal study of the question, how much do schools drive SARS-CoV-2 spread? And the answer is remarkably much less than anyone would think. I mean, there's one more piece of data that you may not know, which is that, you know, if some if you're in a household of four people and and let's say the father comes down with SARS-CoV-2 or the brother or, or the sister, um, the probability a child in that house gets infected with SARS-CoV-2 is about 50 percent. The probability another adult is affected, probably another adult is affected is roughly 12 percent for child is about 6 percent. Kids are much less likely to be infected with the virus, even with the same household exposure. OK, now let me talk about what if we keep schools closed. So I talked about teachers, children, the public. What about if we keep it closed? Um, when it comes to children, we're facing, I think, a calamity we have not yet fully seen. One, there is the loss of grade levels. Um, grade levels are, are, are it, sounds, it sounds like you, know, you can always catch up. But the truth about life is you can't always catch up. And educational losses are linked to graduation, linked to upward mobility, your ability to earn more than what your parents earned. Um, we already see evidence, and I'll show you uh, some brief evidence, that kids are facing unprecedented levels of anxiety and depression, particularly teenage children, um, from being, being isolated from their friends, teachers and staff. I think there are some teachers who enjoy um, remote education. There's some who find it difficult, and I, I believe teachers fall across the spectrum. Um, many teachers and staff are frustrated with problems with children's uh, Wi-Fi reception. There's that famous picture of, of um, children who are in the parking lot of a Taco Bell just to get Wi-Fi. Attendance is dropping. Attention is dropping. It's very difficult to keep very young children interested in a Zoom, uh, particularly five-year-old children parents and society. Women have been adversely impacted in the workforce. Women are um, unfortunately feeling the disproportionate impact of, of childcare that comes from school closure. Uh, we see that even in the scientific world where women are much less likely to submit publications during this time. And I will try to argue at the end of this talk that there is a risk of societal destabilization in ways you cannot predict. Um, academic impacts. Uh, I showed you earlier the very uneven patchwork distribution of public schools being open. Um, there is a big range between in-person, uh, hybrid, and remote education. And, and I do think that there are differences uh, between those two. The more in-person we can get, the better off we'll all be. Um, here's some data, academic impacts. This is data from Ohio. Uh, since the, the start of school closure, every single racial group is falling behind uh, compared to how they would have done in prior years. Um, unfortunately, black and Hispanic children are falling even further behind white children. School closure is a discriminatory policy, a policy where you, if you have wealth, if you have access to resources, you can overcome to some degree the impacts of school closure. 
exposure, be it pods, be it extra supplemental tutoring, be it even putting your kid in private school. But this impact is being disproportionately borne by racial minorities, by, by folks who are from lower socioeconomic status. Um, this is another piece of data, uh, a, a, a broader sample. This looks at educational ascertainment. Now, if, if the dot is on 100% all the way to the right, that means kids are, are learning as much as they learn historically. And what we find is schools with predominantly white populations, the blue dots, they are falling behind. They're falling behind even in you know kindergarten through five, in, in kindergarten, in grade one, in grade two, in grade three, in grade four, in grade five, they're falling behind. But the dark dot is schools where there is predominantly children of color, students of color in these schools, and they are falling behind even more. School closure is exacerbating racial inequality in education. School closure, it does matter. Hybrid is in fact, um, is in fact, so remote is the worst. Hybrid is, 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 is not much better than remote and in-person is better, but even in-person has faced um, detrimental academic impacts since SARS-CoV-2 because in-person uh, ha has often, one of the things parents may tell you that they've been frustrated by is that if one child in a cohort is sick, they're going to potentially quarantine the whole cohort class for 10 days. Uh, that's a very disruptive thing. Um, and, and that also will result in educational losses. So I don't wish to suggest that in-person at a time of SARS-CoV-2 is perfect. It's by no means not perfect, but hybrid and fully remote are in fact inferior in terms of academic impacts. Um, this is another graph. This comes from Raj Chetty, the, uh, the Harvard economist and his team. Uh, what they're showing you here is based on the first COVID case, the national emergency declared um, CARES uh, Act was enacted. The stimulus payments came. This is an, this is, they have a project where they're looking at children who get online math tutoring. And this is just showing you the rate with which the children are participating in this educational initiative. And what you see is if you're from a high income household, yes, you fall behind, but you've caught back up. If you're from middle income household, you fall behind, you have not yet caught up, you're 5% behind, and low income households are hit the hardest. It's the hardest for low income students to find a laptop reliable Wi Fi and participate in, in this online math education. Risks to kids. Um, you know, I want to put you put it in context yet one more time, the risk of SARS-CoV-2 to children. This is a table that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It came out in the fall of last year. This is the risk of October to 2020 that a child will die of different things versus suicide, homicide, transportation accidents in October 2018, a couple years before. Obviously, death in car accidents is very different when people are sheltering in place and we're not driving as much. So this is a comparison of last year to this year. Let me just pick five to 14 year olds. The risk of death of COVID-19 in a five to 14 year old is one in a million. The denominator here is a million. These are age adjusted mortality rates per million. The risk that the same child will commit suicide in a normal year is 10 times as much. So I, 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 I think that, um, that any death to a child is a deep tragedy. Um, however, we have to put the risk of SARS-CoV-2 in perspective. There is a tenfold, there's a ninefold increased risk that the child will kill himself or uh, herself in a year that doesn't have SARS-CoV-2. So we're doing all this for a risk to children, which is on par um, with seasonal influenza, on par with risks that unfortunately children face. Um, just a few more slides and I'll just wrap up. One, uh, this came out just today. Um, a new CDC study finds children attending school entirely or partially online, as well as their parents, may be at increased risk for mental and physical health problems. Both may need extra support during the pandemic. Um, this is a CDC study today. Um, there's, there's something you don't see. You have not yet seen it, but when you see it, it will, it will change the moral valence of this discussion. And that is the children who are currently uh, being abused and uh, trapped with the abuser. This is data that comes from a national survey of ER visits for child abuse. The dark blue line is 2020. The light blue line is prior years. Um, what, am, what am I trying to show you here? Prior to the, the de declaration of national emergency, the number of kids presenting to the emergency department with a complaint of child abuse, either launched by a school, launched by a third party, it was on par with prior years. The moment the national emergency happened, children are trapped at home. There are three million children no one has seen. The, the reports of abuse have dropped. They have since re, re, returned 
to pre um, nine, to pre uh, year levels. Um, but uh, one possibility is that the rates of actual abuse may be even higher as children are trapped at home. One one clue that this is true is this. This is the same CDC paper they're showing you here. Um, among all ED visits for kids, what percent of the visits for kids are for abuse? Now, kids can come to the ED for all sorts of reasons. Uh, they've broken their arm, they've fallen off their bike, um, you know, uh, they feel febrile, but now a higher proportion of visits are for child abuse among, among um, children presenting to the emergency room. Um, what do I wish to say here? I wish to say there's something there's something an availability bias, which means that every day you open the New York Times, you see on the masthead, you see that counter of the number of Americans who died of SARS-CoV-2, and it breaks my heart. And no one wants to see that any higher. We want to see that as low as possible. But what you don't see is the number of children who have been abused that day, who no one is there to rescue, who are silently being trapped with the abuser. Those stories are not on the masthead of the New York Times. Someday those stories will come out. I have said before, I believe there will be a 60 minutes episode where these children tell you what happened to them. And the moment that becomes equally available to you, I think many people may feel differently about this choice. The last thing I'd say in, in the last couple of minutes before I turn it over to questions is the CDC guidance. This president and this CDC came into power saying we want to get kids back in schools within 100 days. Um, you know, we are we're we're getting close to that. Um, the CDC came out with guidance that they they claim will get kids in schools. I have been very critical that I don't think it goes far enough. Here's why. This is their report. This is how we can get kids back in schools. Um, you see here in the picture, they want all the desks six feet apart from each other. We'll talk about that. The first thing. Um, the, the CDC says that you shouldn't have schools going when there are more than 100 cases in the red, I'm talking about the red zone here, 100 cases per 100,000 people in the past seven days. Now you remember earlier where I showed you those things where there's like 1,000 cases per 100,000 people in uh, Wisconsin and they ran schools. That was a single day. This is a summation of seven days. This is the equivalent of like 15 cases per day per 100,000. This is a very low level of transmission. I mean, it's still obviously not a good level of transmission for a pandemic. However, it is much lower than the rates of transmission in places that did open school successfully. And yet the CDC here says, if it's in this red tier, you ought not do it. And I think that's extremely risk averse in terms of opening schools. What was the threshold based on was based on not previous CDC statements, but based on average daily cases over the last seven days. It wasn't based on data from North Carolina, which was you know at least uh, 10 times higher, not based on the Wisconsin data. It was based on a UK study, 38,000 settings where kids went back to school in the United Kingdom in the summer of last year. And here's what they found. This is the relationship between the incidence of COVID per 100,000. Here it's a daily incidence, not a seven day uh, accumulation. Um, and so that's why, you know, 15 is roughly their 100. Um, and, and it shows you there is some relationship between the regional incidence and the number of outbreaks, which is defined as two or more kids who are, or adults who got sick. But the relationship between regional incidence and just the raw number of cases, there's actually no relationship here. There's no relationship here. And I actually, as somebody who does a lot of sort of data analysis, this is a very, um, there's only a few data points that, that drive this analysis. And if this number was a little bit lower, this relationship would vanish as well. It's a very uh, flimsy relationship. And what nobody's talking about is that the absolute risk. Um, the absolute risk is that there's about a two tenths of 1%, you know, so one, one, one fifth of 1% risk of having two or more cases, even in the highest rates of transmission. So putting in those all together, this is a little bit complicated. I guess the point I want to make to you is that the relationship between community spread and spread in schools, thank goodness, they're not so tightly linked. And they're not so tightly linked because when schools open, people do reasonable things. They crack open windows, they have ventilation, they wear masks in school. And when you do those things, you break that relationship. So the CDC guidelines probably shouldn't tie reopening decisions to community transmission because we were able to open in places with the most rip-roaring transmission pre-vaccine, and we didn't have widespread in-school transmission. Okay, the last thing I'll show you. 
They did a study in Massachusetts. This is the rate with which people acquire SARS-CoV-2. Students and adults, if you had three feet between kids or six feet between kids. And as you can see here, the blue and the, and the gray, this is staff with three or six feet. And the yellow and the orange is students between three or six feet. Staff is always higher than students. And sometimes there's some studies that suggest that staff may spread it to each other in the, in the teacher's lounge. Um, and adults are at higher risk of getting this, you know, even outside of the school. Um, but what's notable here is that the distance, three or six feet, appears to have no difference in terms of these groups. And the CDC, accordingly, as of yesterday, and I think that they'll change it tomorrow, they're considering going to three feet. Three feet is critical. Three feet is the difference between hybrid and in-person education. Six feet cannot be done. People cannot put keep six feet of distance between kids and put them on a bus and get them to school. If you want schools to open, if schools need to go back, because the net calculus suggests that on average, on balance, we're better off by having kids in school than out of school, both for their own, both for health, but also for those very intangible things that school provides, then I think that the calculus favors three feet. Okay, the last thing I'd say, democracy. Um, this is a quote by Madeleine Albright, uh, former Secretary of State. While democracy in the long run is the most stable form of government, in the short run, it is among the most fragile. I think we have seen in recent weeks how fragile our institutions of democracy can be. Thank goodness we're back on track, but they are very fragile. It only takes a moment and, and democracy itself uh, can be threatened. Um, there was an article that came out in March of 2020. It was published in STAT. It has been criticized because some people read it as downplaying the, the risk of the pandemic. I don't read it that way. I read it as an article that really expressed a lot of uncertainty at a time where a lot of people were certain that something bad is coming. It expressed more uncertainty. And, and I think it's reasonable to be critical of the article for expressing that uncertainty. But one of the things about being critical of something is that, you know, just because you can be critical of something doesn't mean there wasn't something within it that is perhaps a pearl of wisdom. This is what the article says in it. One of the bottom lines is we do not know how long social distancing measures and lockdowns can be maintained without major consequences to the economy, society, and mental health. Unpredictable evolutions may ensue, in including a financial crisis, unrest, civil strife, war, and a meltdown of social fabric. This was, an, this was just in this article. The 2020s, the next 10 years, I think, are going to be critical. Wealth inequality has never been as bad as it has been in this country. Xenophobia. We have a small uh, but, uh, but growing group of people who are uh, fearful and reluctant to embrace immigration, to embrace folks who, who, who may look different and come from different places, like my own parents. Um, racial animus we see every day in the newspaper. Racial animosity uh, th that is getting even more heated. Now there are breakdowns in education. And these breakdowns in education they're not hitting everyone the same. They don't hit a wealthy person the same as they hit somebody of a lower socioeconomic class. There's more racial disparities. There's more political polarization. You put all this together and school closure is the gasoline on our society. We are incredibly vulnerable. And by vulnerable, I mean that when you take a group of people and you deprive them of education and, and, you, and you hurt them, you hurt them economically, you hurt their upward mobility, you hurt their lives, um, when it comes for them to vote for someone, they may so easily be seduced by the demagogues and the charlatans, the folks who promise things uh, that, uh, that are undeliverable. Um, and I think we've seen this a few times in history. So my conclusion, schools must reopen. I think that on balance, there is a benefit to kids, um, that th there are real risks with anything to children. Um, there's a risk that a child will commit suicide as well. Um, on balance, uh, schools appear very safe for kids. The virus, thank God, is not as bad in them as it is in older people. Um, there's a massive benefit to parents. Uh, I didn't go through all this data, but women have been disproportionately being pushed out of the workforce. Um, there's at most a modest increased risk to teachers. I believe that that's true. It's modifiable. Um, but you know what? As somebody who go has gone to the hospital every week uh, this whole pandemic, um, you know, it's a blessing and a curse to have an essential job. It's a curse because you have to put yourself out there, but it's a blessing to know that what you're doing really matters. And my hat is off to every teacher. What they do really matters. Um, and we need them to do what they do because it is so essential. Um, I do not believe there is a strong risk to society in terms of spread, and I do believe, um, perhaps, perhaps rather naively, that there are some risks that are very difficult to quantify. And what is the risk when you take a society and you deprive them of education? There may be risks to democracy itself. So um, I will stop there. These are some books I've written, but they're mostly about biomedicine uh, and not about sort of social policy. But um, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take questions.
All right, thank you for the informative presentation. The first um, question comes from a student who asks, how can the source of COVID be tracked for teachers? For example, if a student spreads it to an in-person teacher versus teaching work versus a teacher working in person who got COVID from another source? It's a good question. Um, I would say um, to this question that this is when, when people go on TV and they talk about something called contact tracing, this is what they mean. So um, all of these states have a public health division and that public health division is good at contact tracing. Um, before SARS-CoV-2, when would you care about contact tracing? Well, let's say um, you present uh, with uh, a food poisoning and five people come to local hospitals with food poisoning. Well, they, they, they initiate a contact tracing investigation and they try to find the source that unites the explanation of where all these people could have gotten it. Um, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, what happens is for students and teachers who are infected um, and they're part of a school, the public health department will interrogate their contacts. They will be asked to say, where were you on Thursday? Where were you on Friday? Where were you on Wednesday? And they will go through those people and see, are any of those other people ill? And they will try to reconstruct a timetable that explains at what place all these people became ill. And, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, we saw that with the choir, there's some choir where they were all singing at the top of their lungs in a room and 76 of them came ill. And the other thing I would say about contact tracing is um, uh, this is the way in which countries like Australia have gotten to near zero. I mean, they, 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 they may not have had the same starting burden of COVID when they shut down in March, they may have had less. And then once you drive COVID to a certain number, you can use contract tracing to exterminate every last cluster by isolating all those people. So that is the method. Um, I guess I would say that, you know, if you, the next question would be like, well, is this a perfect method? And of course it's not perfect. Um, however, I would point out that many of the people who have been critical of these studies for using contact tracing are the same people who believe contact tracing can get you to COVID zero or no COVID at all. Um, so if you have to believe it's pretty good if it can get you to zero. So I think I, I personally believe that this is a tried and true method. The next question is also from a student. They're saying, where I live, parents themselves rarely wear masks. Has there been backlash from parents in any of the places that schools have opened regarding their children having to wear face coverings? How should school staff enforce mask mandates on campus? Good question. I guess I would say that um, the honest answer is I suspect that um, many parents are, are are so grateful to have the in-person school that they're willing to play ball with the restrictions, even if they themselves may not a, a believe in all of them. The next thing I would say is that in, in these uh, states, I believe it was the Wisconsin study, where the teachers reported uh, a 92% adherence um, to masks among the kids. Um, my understanding from speaking to the study author was these are in counties that may have voted disproportionately for, for Donald Trump and may have had strong mask aversion. Uh, what's my point here? My point here is that I think kids I think kids truly do want to do the right thing. I think parents and kids on this issue are willing to um, do what it takes to get the kids in school because I think parents want them to do that. Um, and, and, and and I, I, and I do think, um, and the, I guess the last point, the last thing I want to, sh to, sh to share with you, I guess, is to say that, um, you know, um, we, we focus a lot on the people who stubbornly refuse to wear masks, and I cannot explain their behavior. I don't know what they want or why they're doing that. Um, but I would say that, you know, when I look at the national polls, I still see the vast majority of Americans, 70 plus percent, 70, 80 percent, are willing to do what it takes um, to, to end this pandemic, including wearing masks. And so I think that that's, um, you know, that's something that has to be dealt with. And then I guess the last thing to say is, um, in some of these studies, they, there are moments where the kids didn't wear masks, for instance, when they're eating lunch. And, and that also was associated with not a great increased risk of infection. Um, as vaccination is deployed, um, we can try to study you know, if there can be breaks in the mask wearing, if it has to be all day, if, it, if they can get a break at recess or outdoors. I think these are very reasonable things to, to study. Next question. Um, even with high levels of vaccination, what practices do you believe should stay in place? I guess um, it's tough because there's two things. There's a medical side of things and there's the political side of things. And let me, I guess, explain a little bit of both. The medical side of things is, you know, in medicine, when we, when I don't know the answer to a question, my my answer is always, you got a, you got a thousand classrooms open, 
500, you do one thing and 500, you do the other thing. And you're gonna get the answer real quick. You know, get the answer real quick. So can you go from three feet to six feet in Massachusetts? They did something kind of like that. They looked at a bunch of hundreds of classrooms with it and without it. And they showed you those curves. And so what I would do is I would recommend we do that in a staggered way. So have the kids wear masks, hand, hand hygiene, get back in school. And then, and then do, you know, some people get longer recess than others. Sometimes maybe you rent, you, uh, assign, we call it randomization, you assign some classes randomly, that maybe you actually remove all the requirement within the cohort. Um, you know, I don't know the answer, but possibly the benefits are to, if you separate 15 kids from all the other kids, they don't intermingle, but these 15 kids can perhaps speak freely with each other. Maybe they can remove the mask or be closer together. Um, I'm not saying that I know that to be safe. It's never been studied. But what I'm saying is, I guess as a scientist, I would try to randomly assign them to that strategy or the other strategy and see, is, it, is there a detriment? Um, uh, vaccination will change things dramatically, very dramatically. For instance, um, why are we so uh, rightfully afraid of SARS-CoV-2, it's because that a fraction of people get very, very sick and they get deathly sick. Um, vaccination is very good at preventing you from getting a runny nose, a cough, and having SARS-CoV-2. That's what we call symptomatic or mild SARS-CoV-2, but it is exceptionally good at eliminating severe SARS-CoV-2. In fact, in a pooled analysis of about 80,000 people in all the vaccine studies, we're talking about less than five cases of severe SARS-CoV-2 and to my knowledge, zero deaths. Um, what does that mean? When you take the fangs out of the snake, you can hold the snake more comfortably. In other words, um, if teachers are fully protected, if staff are fully protected, um, and if no one is getting severe illnesses, then we will naturally, society will relax restrictions. Um, you don't even need to take my word for it. That is literally what's happened in India in the last um, five weeks. Um, their rates of SARS-CoV-2 have plummeted for a number. We could talk about that for half a day. Um, but um, but they have plummeted and society has reopened rapidly. So I think that we're talking about what it takes to get people back. So the reason I call it a political question is um, sometimes what you need to do to make someone feel comfortable might be more than what the evidence strictly uh, recommends, but that's okay. That's life. And that's, that's a series of life is always a series of compromises. Um, and so, so getting people back with masks, with three feet of distance, with good hand hygiene, with uh, segregation between cohorts of classes, that's important. Um, and then maybe we can relax it down the road. How do new variants of coronavirus complicate the ability to use evidence on previous variants to create education policy? That's a great question. I guess I would say um, there are there are a few things about variants, um, boy, um, that that are beyond what you read in the news. Um, but let me let me start by saying one thing. Um, when you ask yourself, is the, does the vaccine protect against the variant? It means several things. So one, um, if you, in a real world situation where people are vaccinated, are they getting very sick with the variant or not? And you can look at South Africa in the last one month. In the last one month in South Africa, the actual number of people who are sick with SARS-CoV-2 has plummeted despite the presence of the South African variant, which is the, one of the worst ones. Um, so that's one piece of data. The second piece of data is laboratory data, which is um, in my bloodstream, I've been vaccinated. In my bloodstream, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you take my antibodies and 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 squirt it on this. Uh, you know, if you if you if you look at my antibodies and how they react to these variants, how well do they neutralize it? And a lot of the data shows that they they still neutralize it in 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 sort of levels of efficacy we would accept, but it's not as potent as if we neutralize the wild type um, variant. The last thing I would say about variants. Um, Imagine there are two strains of SARS-CoV-2. You know, we didn't, we haven't sequenced every single human being on this planet who had SARS-CoV-2 and viruses mutate to some degree. But imagine there's two strains, strain A and strain B. And let's say hypothetically, strain A has a 10% chance of spreading to a household contact member. Strain B has a 10% chance of spreading to household contact member. Okay, identical, right? Now let's say, now let's say, sorry, now let's say um, by chance, Every time you meet somebody with A, there were 10 people in a row, and just by the luck of the draw, none of them got SARS-CoV-2. But by chance, the 10% chance you get sick with B happened to affect four people, okay? Now magnify that, zoom out. You look at a population of people, and you used to have A and B in equal frequencies, but now you have a lot of B, a lot of B. And you look retrospectively at the risk of infection in that cohort, what you will conclude is B is way more infectious than A because back in past, they were the same and now there's a lot more B than A. So B must be spreading at a lot higher rate of spread than A. That's what it'll look like to you. 
However, it's just a property of randomness or stochasticity. Why do I say this? Um, a lot of the data that came out very early about B1.1.1, B1.1.7, the UK variant, um, was data that showed an increased risk of infectivity in a cohort in which it gained prominence. And it's very difficult to separate that from stochastic or random events from a true increased risk of infectivity. You need laboratory studies to back it or you need a different cohort. And to put some numbers on it, in the B.1.17 case, um, the data showed that if, if you live in a house with somebody with COVID and they had regular COVID, your risk of getting sick was 11%. But if it was B.1.1.7, it was 15%, which is higher, but it's not 50%, 60%. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is, so my knowledge, my understanding is that even with variants, um, that these vaccines have uh, nearly perfect efficacy against bad outcomes. So to put it all together, I guess I would say, um, and I guess I would say that I could tell you a little bit more about variants, but I guess I would say that I think, um, I think my impression is that these variants do not fundamentally change the game until they truly reach vaccine escape. Um, and if they truly reach vaccine escape, I think it will change the game outside of schools a lot more than in schools. And then I think we will have to face a question, which is, can we as a society keep our kids out of schools for two plus years? And I think that's almost untenable. Um, and I, I, I don't know what will happen to literally the fabric of society if that is to continue. Do you have data on COVID spread rate at colleges that remained open or opened at some point during the pandemic? <laughs> it was a famous CDC study. The famous CDC study shows that counties in which colleges opened um, and then subsequently closed, they had more rates of SARS-CoV-2 cases um, than counties uh, in the same state in which they didn't. Um, there is a modeler named Yu Yang Gu. He is an MIT graduate, and he uh, know, knew nothing about SARS-CoV-2 prior to this pandemic. But he came out and he made models to predict how many people are going to get SARS-CoV-2. The thing about Yu Yang Gu is his models outperformed many people who've spent their lives doing this. He's a very good modeler. Yu Yang Gu looked at that exact same data, and he asked in the, in the months and months afterwards, did they still have a sustained increase in those counties? And he found that that was not the case. The other challenge with that data is – when colleges are open, um, obviously, there's going to be more cases for one reason, because they get a lot more testing. Um, and so how you must adjust the number of cases for the amount of testing. So my honest answer to you is that having looked at this data a fair bit, I personally um, do not know uh, at this moment whether or not the opening of colleges is a significant driver of SARS-CoV-2. Um, I do know that if a college kid were to get sick with SARS-CoV-2, um, it is um, – uh, it, it, they're much more likely to be sick than, say, a six-year-old. Um, so I can tell you that. But I think there's there's going to be a lot of uncertainty there. Um, and it will take us a little bit of time, but people will eventually come back to that question. Uh, but I think if you're interested in this, there I did a podcast episode with Yu Yang Gu on this podcast called Plenary Session where he walks you through this data. On the topic of colleges, the next question is, is there more or less of a risk for college students who are living and interacting together um, in our case, within one square mile, as opposed to K through 12 students who are only attending class together for part of a day? That's a great question. I guess I would say that, you know, um, as with any bubble, I mean, it, the, 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 the theoretical understanding would be that it is safer to be in, in a bubble with all the other people who've been tested. Now, the greatest example of that is the NBA. My understanding is that the NBA invested a lot of money early on to get all the NBA players in a bubble. I think they did it at one of the Walt Disney World resorts, and they kept them all there. And every single person, literally thousands of people, were tested very frequently, and they were made to make sure they were negative, and they preserved that bubble. Now, when you have schools open, um, you will not be able to sustain that. Um, however, then, then I would I would point you back at that Germany study. I think that Germany study is the clearest thing uh, that addressed that particular situation. But I guess if I were to um, pick, I would I would say that probably your situation is pretty good as long as you can rely on the fact that um, uh, there won't be defection or cheating uh, among some of your <laughs> colleagues, which I think you can. Um, what about um, spring break? Is there justification for quarantining students upon return from travel? Is this enforceable? Um, I mean, there's certainly a rationale, which is that if you go to spring break, that it's very likely that you will uh, be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 if you've been unvaccinated. Um, 
you know, uh, the the policy is very tricky. And I mean, I mean, I'll be I'll be very honest with you about the 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 difference between. Um, I guess I would say, and I'll tell you an anecdote in a second. But I guess I would say, um, I think it's very tricky to know if if people are going to follow that. How you're going to enforce that with any sort of mandate? I'll give you one example. Um, very early on in the pandemic, it became clear people uh, recognized the importance of masks, and they started to feel very passionately about masks. And I think it's I have said the whole time, it's entirely reasonable. You go out there, put your mask on. I'm happy to do it. Um, but there's a second order question, which is what do you do if you come across somebody who doesn't, doesn't have the mask on? What do you do about them? And uh, the CDC had guidance actually that said, if you're a business like a Home Depot and you got somebody in your store and they don't have a mask on, here's what you do about it. You walk away, walk away from them, give them a wide berth, let them get out of there. You don't confront them. That was the CDC guidance. Now, why? Um, I saw I saw a lot of doctors who felt uh, very uh, they didn't like that guidance. Um, they started to say that, like, if there's somebody in that Home Depot without a mask on, I think Home Depot has an obligation to say, sir, put on a mask or, you know, you're out of the store. We're going to boot you out. Um, this is this is what I think is the, always the trickiest part about policy, because a mask can be good, but how you enforce a mandate has to be judged on its own merits. So I think the reason the CDC reached the guidance they did was they thought what would happen if. If we have some Home Depot employee confront somebody uh, for not having a mask, what will happen in a country where you know we're on the eve of an election, tensions were high, a lot of people have concealed firearms, um, and I think their worry was the risk of gun violence would be far higher than the benefit you would get from con confronting this person. The second thing I think they think about is when you confront somebody without a mask, um, they're going to yell at you. I mean, potentially they will yell at you, and the moment they start yelling, the risk of transmission is going up and up and up. And so that's why I think from a policy question, it's, it's, it's good to know what you want to do in a perfect world, but you must always realize that policy is made in the messy world of people where they don't always react the way you want them to react. And you have to think, what will you do to enforce it? And so it's great to have suggestions and guidance, um, but it's al always better before you make draconian policy to think about what might happen if people don't comply with it the way you want. How do we know that harms to children, such as increased abuse or self-harm from lockdown measures will go away with school openings? In other words, what evidence is there that school closures are the key contingency as opposed to living through a once in a century pandemic, regardless of school opening policies? Yeah, I guess I would say that um, I'm not entirely convinced that the rate with which kids is abused will get better unfortunately. Um, so that's not the claim. I think the claim is that um, because of closure, there are kids being abused who are not being detected. There's always a certain rate with which we've been detecting abuse. And now we have taken that rate and we've halved it. We've cut it dram dramatically. And we've increased exposure time to the potential source of the abuse. Um, and yet we still return to nearly pre-baseline levels of abuse. Um, so I think that it is an open hypothesis, but I think some would contend that it is likely there is more abuse happening now than before, because the number one source of abuse is actually people, unfortunately, people who live with a child. And then the second thing is that there's some abuse that the abuse that gets detected is often the worst abuse. When the kid comes to school and visibly you can see that they have been abused um, and that abuse is not being picked up. And so what I think is it is, is it's not just that any abuse is not being picked up. It's that the most egregious abuse is not being picked up. Um, and picking it up is important because then you pick it up, these kids are pulled from these, these, these places of abuse. Um, and then there is a psychological thing that's hard to articulate, which is that if you are the victim of abuse and there is no end in sight, it is deeply unspeakable. Uh, it's very harmful to that person. Um, and so human beings rely on the hope that they will be rescued and the hope is taken away. And so I think it's almost an existential thing. Um, I'm a cancer doctor and I deal with life and death all the time. And I will tell you, the more you do that and you see things, you will realize that there are things worse, and, worse than death. And, and some of these things may, in fact, I would hesitate to put it, I would put in that category. Will school reopenings be a local control issue in California, or should we expect some state level action? That's that's a good question. I mean, there's a recall petition for the governor. Uh, the city of San Francisco is actually litigating. The city is taking the schools board the schools to court. Um, this is unprecedented. I, I I do not know how it will be reconciled. There are. Um, 
Um, and and I and I also want to say that I don't actually think anyone is a bad actor here. There's nobody here who has an ill intention. Um, the teachers' unions have pushed back against school reopenings broadly, and I've been rather critical of them. But teachers' unions are um, a, a product of the system as well. They often represent the interests of the oldest teachers at the expense of the interests of the youngest t- teachers. That's just the, ne- the 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 nature of unions. Um, they rightly may be worried about their own well-being and safety. Um, they uh, very rightly. I think they're very rightly to be worried about that. And it may not have helped that the media messaging on this topic has been a yo-yo from extreme fear um, to uh, it's totally fine. And and naturally, people do not like being uh, uh, played like that, just like people didn't like being told you, you shouldn't wear a mask in early March and then you really ought to wear the mask by April. Um, that's not a good way to message. And so I think teachers unions are doing what they think is best. I think politicians are trying to balance the strong powers of the unions and, and other forces. Um, I think there's a problem which I call school hesitancy. We know about vaccine hesitancy where some racial minority groups may be less likely to get a vaccine because they are rightly concerned with some abuses of the medical system in the past. Um, now we see schools hesitancy where there is a bo- there is a difference between racial groups in terms of the, their, their willingness to send their kids back to school. Um, I think you have to deal with it the same way you do with vaccine hesitancy with a lot of compassion um, and a lot of really careful empathetic uh, messaging. Um, so the answer to your question is, um, I, I know it will be a local decision. That's the politics of it. It is a local control decision. Um, uh, but I don't know exactly how it'll play out. Um, and 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 I, I would have thought that vaccination would have changed the game, but I think that even that is, is, is proving that it may not be enough. You spoke to this briefly in your presentation, but can you speak more about what school closures mean for child development in the long term? I think nobody knows the answer, but here's some things we do know. We know that if I know uh, your uh, your income, I know uh, a, I know, uh, or if I know your genome, I probably know more about your life expectancy in this country from knowing your income and where you live. Um, income is a incredibly potent uh, predictor of longevity in this country. Um, upward mobility is is not just it's not just food on the table. It's literally life. It's it's people live longer with upward mobility. Um, I would say that th- some of these grade losses, particularly, th- I mean, we're talking about some kids who were going to graduate high school and they're not going to graduate. I think uh, it will not be able to be remedied. Um, I think that um, there will be educational losses. Um, I'm going to write an article soon where we're going to say what you need to do to fix this. What you need to do to fix this is um, things that people may not people have long resisted, such as year-round school, um, paid tutoring. You're going to take money and you're going to pour it on these children, not on the teachers, not on the staff, not on the school districts, but on the children themselves. You have to support these kids. We need an unprecedented investment in children, in my opinion, to even try to regain what we've lost. Um, if we don't do that, and, ev- and even if we did do that, there's still going to be loss, and that loss will be you know, less upward mobility, less well-paying jobs, more, I would I would these are things I'm speculating, but I would expect to be true. More teen pregnancy, more gun violence, more substance abuse, more alcoholism. Um, uh, schools is one of the, you know, in this country, there are only a few ladders of opportunity left that we dangle down and schools has long been one of them. And we've just clipped that, we've clipped that one ladder. Uh, and so I think it's going to, it'll have repercussions on a lot of aspects of social life. Before we conclude, do you have any parting thoughts for our audience? And I think they're all great questions. I guess I would say the parting thoughts I have for the audience is, I guess I have one parting thought. Maybe you'll find it interesting, something I think about. Um, if SARS-CoV-2, the same virus with the same property, the same, ra- the same rate with which it kills people, uh, had occurred in different periods of time. So I guess one I want to say, I think SARS-CoV-2 is, a, is a, a terrible plague. I mean, it's a horrible virus. It's killed my patients. I, I've hate it from the moment I ever heard of it. And if I could, and, uh, but that said, if it had presented in different years, I think it would have played out differently. The reason SARS-CoV-2 played out the way it did in 2020 was both a product of who we are as a people. We were people who have certain, um, we were exposed to a certain media environment that always reminds us of some risks, but, but downplays and ignores and hides other risks. That's just who we are. Two, we're people who have a certain compass of what risks we're willing to accept and how much safety we're willing to have. If you go back and read the history books of 1918, many books will not even mention it, despite the fact it killed more people, because there are, there are people who have lived through World War I. If you go back to 1958, the flu that hit that year, you will note that there are many people who don't think too much about it, despite the fact that it, it had a, a terrible casualty rate. And that's because they had lived through two world wars. 
They're different people. And then the other thing I'd say is the technology is different. If we didn't have Uber Eats, if we didn't have Zoom, if we didn't have Amazon Prime, people tell me this pandemic would have been worse. More people would have died. But I'm not necessarily sold on that. These are tools that have permitted white collar folks, folks who um, otherwise might have lost their job, did not lose their job. And it made folks comfortable. And the moment you make privileged people comfortable, you remove the societal pressure to invest in real public health. And I think to some degree, schools falls into that. Because if you have money, you can avoid many of the pains of schools where you can't if you don't have money. Um, if you have money, you can avoid the pains of park closures where you can't if you don't have money. And so I think some of these tools like Uber Eats and Prime and Zoom, um, they actually may have worsened the pandemic is a hypothesis I have, and I will be working on that in some work. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Dr. Prasad and to all of those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual ATH event, which will be next Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Yusuf Komunyaka will join us for an evening of poetry and reflections. Thank you all and have a great evening.